give our lives, right? Like Paul gave his life. The apostles gave their lives. The reformers gave their lives. People need Jesus, y'all. The Seventh-day Adventist Church gives its life. All right. Happy Sabbath, everybody. I'm going to start out by reading the memory text from this morning. Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Did Cain and Abel both worship God? They sure did. In verse 8, And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. We love to raise Cain. We do. We love to raise Cain. I guess that may be where that came from. Makes total sense. What could that mean? This morning I'm going to say something, to say something else. Please bow your heads with me as we go to the King of Life and ask him to help us this morning. Oh, gracious Father in heaven, this is your congregation. This is your movement. We're here on your holy Sabbath day. Lord, we ask right now that you speak. Lord, we need you to talk to us. We need your spirit to dwell within each and every soul here and help us to understand what you want for us, which is always what's best for us. In Jesus' holy name we ask these things. Amen. All right. So it says, I'm going to repeat the verses. In a process of time it came to pass that Cain brought up the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. And like I said, it's a memory text. And Abel, he also brought of the, first, the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and unto his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Hmm. Interesting that I seem to recall Jesus talking about a contrasting figure to sin at the door in Revelation 3.20. Another, another thing standing at the door. In Revelation 3.20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Is there a difference between sin lying at the door and Jesus standing at the door? They both seem to be at your door. There's a reason I'm asking. Who do we open the door for? We are very obviously living in the last moments of this Earth's history. This is affecting the entire planet. Not one day goes by that you can't find absolutely horrible events happening somewhere on this planet and they actually seem to be increasing. 
as my wife faithfully points out in detail on many Sabbaths before divine worship. It is time to wake up, everybody. In this day and age where everyone has to be politically correct or PC, and everyone is so afraid that they may offend someone, it is not viewed as politically correct to speak the hard truth. What does the forerunner say? The truth is the truth whether you like it or not. <laughs> Especially when it comes to the issues pointed out directly in the three angels' messages. The information in this message deals with God's view on the Antichrist and the warnings for those living in the very last days of Earth's history. Now this is not a three angel sermon, I don't believe. Although every Sabbath should have a three angel sermon built into it. God tells us in Deuteronomy 6, verses 5 through 9. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 6, verses 5 through 9. Five verses, five through nine. Six verses, five through nine. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. Also, turn with me to Deuteronomy 11, verses 18 through 21. Therefore, shall you lay up these, my words, in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou risest up, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt write them upon the doorpost of thine house, and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied, and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them, as the days of heaven upon the earth. Hmm. Sounds like he means for us to do something to help us not forget what he's telling us. <coughs> Unfortunately, you hardly ever hear a word being spoken on the three angels' messages. I say hardly because recently it has been touched upon in this church. But for the most part, yeah, hardly. That was not what God established this movement to do. He did not establish us to give a message and then forget about it. Has the devil forgotten about trying to destroy as many souls as he can? No. And he is still on his mission. And he is sure enough picking up his pace. We hear testimonies every Sabbath, just from this little group. And God says that we are still on our mission. Or did we forget? There are people that I know that do not want to hear anything about the spiritual battle which has been waged since the fall of man. I don't want to hear it either. I mean, <laughs> it's terrible. And it really messes with your head to know that there really is an enemy that wants to destroy every good thing that we can't even see. Problem is, he is real. 
and our Father in heaven has given us a warning about him. God is love, agape, not my love, not your love, his love. You don't, and I don't, love like that. The Lord gave us the three angels' messages to warn ourselves and to warn the world about the very real enemy who's trying to get rid of everybody, especially Jesus. Do you ever hear about God's word being attacked? Oh, it's not, it's all allegory. Oh, it's not real history. Oh, it's blah, 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 blah. Sounds like somebody's attacking our savior continuously. So if Jesus is our king and our savior, shouldn't we be standing up for him with the sword of truth? Amen. Warning the world of the enemy at their door? Amen. The world needs Jesus, right? Amen. Now there is a study of history that is not to be condemned. Sacred history was one of the studies in the School of the Prophets. In the record of his dealings with the nations, we trace the footsteps of Jehovah. So today, so today, we are to consider the dealings of God with the nations of the earth. We are to see in history the fulfillment of prophecy, to study the workings of providence and the great reformatory movements and to understand the progress of events and the marshalling of the nations for the final conflict of the great controversy. Testimonies, volume eight, first page 307, paragraph two. That is a commission from God here to do this very work. We are, if we are watchmen on the walls of Zion, we are to watch the events of history and to fit them into prophetic pictures, or we might just miss the point. Amen. In ancient times, all through history, you can see the same pagan deities in these many cultures from the false god like Marduk with his lightning bolts to the Greek pagans and the Nordic and Assyrian ones and the Egyptian ones and so on. I'm making a point. And it is understood that many of these legends have their origins in some reality. And if I have discussed, as I have discussed this with others, how you can actually take mythology, if you carefully look at the details of these false deities, which are devils, you can see how over time the actual truth has been split open and turned upside down and rehashed in a way that someone or some being has deemed to be so. And you can see how God himself in the, in the Old Testament was continuously dealing with this problem with his people. They kept wanting to go back to these pagan deities. They kept trying to go back to paganism that they were used to doing. What happened right when they came out of Egypt, when, when Moses was gone for just a couple days too long. <laughs> and it didn't stop there. The flesh is always trying to drown out the spirit. And Jesus said the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is week. So the pagans, these origins go all the way back to the very beginning. Taking, for example, the pagan, non-existent, false wannabe deity, Marduk. He received a special commission to rule over evil from God, supposedly, and he has the mark of authority to rule over the powers of evil. If you go back into history, there are some who claim this is actually a reference all the way back to the beginning and the story of Cain and Abel. In many of these pagan beliefs, their chief deities have a symbol or a mark of authority. Many times it's an eight-pointed star. Now, when you look at the laws of these ancient governments and their structures of ruling over people, you find some amazing facts. The Code of Hammurabi, dating back to 1772 BC, the code has 282 laws with scaled punishments like an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Does that sound familiar? And so on. Government laws like what we even have today, labor laws, property laws, medical laws, contracts, and so on. The further you go back in time, the more you see these type of governmental laws start to resemble the law of God.
For some, this is Ellen White talking. Actually, this is the SDA Bible commentary talking. For some 45 years, it was thought that the Code of Hammurabi was the oldest collection of laws. In recent years, however, several much older collections of laws have been found. From Nippur comes the Code of Lipit Ishtar, published in 1948. It was written in Sumerian one or two centuries before the Code of Hammurabi, but it is very similar to it and even contains a number of laws identical to the latter. In the same year, 1948, there was, a, there was published another code which had been discovered in Harmal near Baghdad, the code of King Bilalama of Eshnunna, who ruled some 300 years before Hammurabi. This code is clearly a forerunner of the laws of Lipit Ishtar and Hammurabi. In 1954, a law code older than any of the three was published, that of ur Namu, one that contained laws far, far more humane than any of the other laws known thus far. This shows that the closer a document of this nature is related to the original source, which was divine, the more it reveals the character of the real lawgiver, God. In whatever code of laws they may be embodied, all right principles reflect the justice and mercy of the author of right and truth. So interesting to see through time, as people move further away from God, the laws become more re in, you know, restrictive and more intrusive. So there are two groups of people all throughout time, the people of the world and God's people. Do God's people have a law? Yes. The Ten Commandments, which is a transcript of God's character. character. Is there a war on for your mind? Yes. Yes. Oh, there certainly is. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. God's people are living in a world that is ruled for almost the entire planet by not God's people. So with what authority are they ruling? In Genesis 3.15, turn with me to Genesis 3.15. I believe we all know this verse. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This was the first gospel sermon ever preached to fallen man. This promise was the star of hope, illuminating the dark and dismal future of the race. Adam gladly received the welcome assurance of deliverance and diligently instructed his children in the way of the Lord. This promise was presented in close connection with the altar of sacrificial offerings. The altar and the promise stand side by side, and one casts clear beams of light upon the other, showing that the justice of an offended God could be appeased only by the death of his beloved son. In the case of Cain and Abel, we have a type of the two classes that will exist in the world till the close of time. And this type is worthy of close study. Cain represents those who carry out the principles and works of Satan by worshiping God in a way of their own choosing. Like the leader whom they follow, they are willing to render partial obedience, but not entire submission to God. The Cain class of worshipers includes by far the largest number for every false religion that has been invented has been based on the Cain principle that man can depend upon his own merits and righteousness for salvation. That's from Signs of the Times, December 23rd, 1886, paragraph 8. Now, there seems to be a problem with God's people. It's not my words. Let's see what our king has to say. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3, verses 14. Okay. 
And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Amen. So God says we're not, we're not cold or hot. So he will vomit us out. And when he says, he that hath an ear, one of the best things I've ever heard a preacher say about that is, if you don't see your knee, you're not going to listen. And this even sounds to me like we're not living in obedience to God, and these were his words. Look at what God did with the Celts. We watched a cool documentary here called A Pale Horse Rise. I don't know if any of y'all remember that. It was excellent. Among other things, it spoke on how the Celts, or the Vikings, who were once very violent, became farming Christians, all from getting to know Jesus. Is your life about sowing seed and reaping the harvest? Are you complacent? Psalm 51, 1 through 19, is a beautiful psalm, and I'm going to read it. Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me throughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part, Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. 
Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Amen. 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 And amen. If everything has just become a routine, then maybe you need to rethink your faith. If you're not coming to church eager to listen, sitting upright, eager to worship the God who saves, maybe you need to reevaluate your relationship with God. A proud Christian is no Christian. God says we should only boast in the Lord. Not that we believe in him or that we are a Christian, but in what he has done for us and continues to do for us. Jesus says in John 15, one through five, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through my word, which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except you ab it abide in the vine, no more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Y'all know the verse? Okay. There are many verses like this in scripture, and we love to quote them. But are we meditating on them and what they mean for us personally? In Mark 10, 18, and Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none but good but one, that is God. Romans 3, 10 through 12 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Does that mean me? You? James 4, 4 states, you adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. The point here is that none of us naturally choose Jesus. If left up to our own devices, we would flee from him. Naturally, we are selfish. God is the definition of unselfish. Do we qualify for heaven? Are we doing enough for God? Do we focus on him and say, look what I've done? And we give God our undivided attention, looking at God, focusing on God, thinking about God, and squirrel. And the Lord knows that there are many, many squirrels in this world. So what does he ask? By the way, the heart is a deceiver and desperately wicked. Who can know it? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none good, no, not one. So what great act have you done lately for the Lord? By the way, the answer is nothing. Who are you? You think you have faith? What faith? Peter had faith, didn't he? Did he? Did Jesus tell him he wasn't converted? Yes, when he looked at him and said, when you are converted, implying that he was not yet converted. Blows my mind to read that statement. Because this was Peter. Peter was powerful for Jesus. Powerful for Jesus. We are told that there will be enemies in our churches. People who have a Cain mentality, by deductive reasoning that is. 
Where are you? Who are you? Are you ready for what is coming? Are your children ready? Your spouse? Your parents? Your extended family? Your friends? Your neighbors? You know this is true. Deny it if you want, but you can see the very things God has been warning us of happening right in front of us. I'm gonna wrap this up, I promise. We know that this world doesn't have much longer, and God asked that when he does return, will he find faith? What a question. The more I see what is happening in this world, and the more I see people not getting excited about the fact that Jesus is about to be here to take his people home, the more concerned I get about Revelation 3 and the question from Jesus about finding faith. Are we living with a Cain mentality? Do we expect God to just accept our worship however we present it to him? Do we really think we have things all figured out? It is a solemn statement that I make to the church. This is Ellen White, Christian service. It is a solemn statement that I make to the church that not one in 20 whose names are registered upon the church books are prepared to close their earthly history and would be as verily without God and without hope in the world as the common sinner. They are professedly serving God, but they are more earnestly serving mammon. This half and half work is a constant denying of Christ rather than a confessing of Christ. So many have brought into the church their unsubdued spirit, unrefined, their spiritual taste is perverted by their own immoral debasing corruptions, symbolizing the world in spirit, in heart, in purpose, confirming themselves in lustful practices, and are full of deception through and through in their professed Christian life. Living as sinners, claiming to be Christians, those who claim to be Christians and will confess Christ should come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing and be separate. She stated, I lay down my pen and lift up my soul in prayer that the Lord would breathe upon his backslidden people who are as dry bones that they may live. And she said, the end is near, the end is here, stealing upon us so stealthily so imperceptibly, so noiselessly. We think it's gonna be some kind of loud calamity going on. But just search, just a little searches about what's happening in the world, especially with what's happening with the papacy. Where are the Pope's going, what he's doing. It's not loud, it's deception. like the muffled tread of the thief in the night to surprise the sleepers off guard and unready. May the Lord grant to his, to bring his people, his Holy Spirit upon the hearts, upon the hearts of those that are now at ease, that they may no longer sleep as do others, but watch and be sober. Terrible is the struggle that takes place between the forces of good and of evil in important centers where the messengers of truth are called upon to labor. That sentence caught me. Terrible is the struggle that takes place between the forces of good and evil in important centers where the messengers of truth are called upon to labor. That's us. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, declares Paul, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world. Ephesians 6.12, till the close of time there will be a conflict between the church of God and those who are under the control of evil angels. 
the early Christians were often called to meet the powers of darkness face to face. By sophistry and by persecution, the enemy endeavored to turn them from the true faith. At the present time when the end of all things earthly is rapidly approaching, Satan is putting forth desperate efforts to ensnare the world. He's doing a really good job. He is devising many plans to occupy the minds and divert the attention from the truths essential to salvation. In every city, his agencies are busily organizing into parties, those who are opposed to the law of God. The arch deceiver is at work to introduce elements of confusion and rebellion, and men are being fired with a zeal that is not according to knowledge. Wickedness is reaching a height never before attained. And that was in her day. And yet many ministers of the gospel are crying peace and safety. But God's faithful messengers are to go steadily forward with their work. Clothed with the panoply of heaven, they are to advance fearlessly and victoriously, never ceasing their warfare until every soul within their reach shall have received the message of truth for this time. Three angels, anyone? The strongest bulwark of vice in our world is not the iniquitous life of the abandoned sinner or the degraded outcast. It is the life which otherwise appears virtuous, honorable, and noble, but in which one sin is fostered, one vice indulged. Genius, talent, sympathy, even generous and kindly deeds may thus become decoys of Satan to entice souls over the precipice of ruin. We have far more to fear from within than from without. The hindrances to strength and success are far greater from the church itself than from the world. Unbelievers have a right to expect that those who profess to be keeping the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus will do more than any other class to promote and honor by their consistent lives, by their goodly exam godly example and their active influence, the cause which they represent. So we should be representing this cause, Adventism, this message. But how often have the professed advocates of the truth proved the greatest obstacle to its advancement? The unbelief indulged, the doubts expressed, the darkness cherished, encourage the presence of evil angels and open the way for the accomplishment of Satan's devices. The saints must get a thorough understanding of present truth, which they will be obliged to maintain from the scriptures. They must understand the state of the dead, for the spirits of devils will yet appear to them, professing to be beloved friends and relatives who will declare to them that the Sabbath has been changed, also other unscriptural doctrines. That's from early writings, page 87. We have a commission from God to learn the message that we've been given. Do we come to church to give God our couple of hours and not speak to him till the next Sabbath, except for microwave prayers? We've learned about microwave prayers, how fast food cooks in the microwave. What's a microwave prayer? See you, God. God loves us and desperately wants to take us home and to end this sinned, sickened mess. But he cannot take people to heaven that are not truly converted. Peter was with Jesus every day, but Jesus said he wasn't converted. And he had more zeal than anybody I know. 
He seemed like a man of faith. It is time for us, as God's remnant church, to get real, real about our faith and our relationship to God. And it is time to make sure everyone we are connected to know that we have been with Jesus. And we need to be teaching these things to our children and family more than just on Sabbath. God is waiting on a people who perfectly reflect the character of Jesus to exist. Then he will take, he will come to claim them. It doesn't seem we have much time to become part of that group. Call it gloom and doom if you want. I call it simple facts. Are we going home with him or are we going to reject him? There is only the two options. And we are not ready for the conflict that stands before us. God says, get ready, get ready, get ready. Amen. Y'all awake? <laughs> Y'all is now, right? Praise the Lord for that message. We're going to stand this morning as we sing. Trust and obey. That's 590. Bye. 